Hello, I'm Dr. Marla Shapiro, and I'm a member of the Board of Trustees of the International Menopause Society. And today we'll be talking with Professor Anderson. Hello, it's so lovely to have you join us. Can you tell our audience who you are and what you do? Thanks, Marla. Um, yeah, my name is Professor Richard Anderson. I'm um, Professor of Reproductive Science at the University of Edinburgh, and I'm the co-director of the MRC Centre for Reproductive Health here at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and I work in uh, reproductive research, uh, including uh, effects of cancer on fertility, and I also have some interest in, in male reproductive function as well. Um, and clinically, I work in, in reproductive endocrinology and infertility at the Royal Infirmary in Edinburgh. So today we're going to be focusing on a hormone that you're doing research on, AMH or anti-malarian hormone. So firstly, where is it and what does it come from and what does it do? So classically, of course, uh, AMH is a male hormone because it was originally described as being produced by the Sertoli cells of the developing testis. And its function is to do exactly what its name suggests, to cause regression of the malarian system. So a very male role. But it was subsequently found that it's actually produced by granulosa cells of growing follicles. And I think actually the original studies were in the chicken, um, in fact, rather than in a, a conventional mammalian system. But what subsequently emerged is that AMH is produced by growing follicles in the ovary. It's not produced by the primordial follicles, but as soon as the follicles start to grow, AMH gets expressed in granulosa cells and is then uh, released into the bloodstream and becomes detectable. And the amount in the bloodstream really reflects, therefore, the activity of the ovary, the number of growing follicles that are developing at any one stage. And so would that, um, be, sorry, sorry, Jack, would that would that be its, its chief role in terms of looking at the, the specialized or different function of AMH compared to other ovarian hormones? So the, this, the most established role of AMH is in assisted reproduction. In, um, it's, it's widely used in IVF circles in measuring AMH before an IVF cycle to give a predictor of how well that woman's ovaries are going to respond. So you're looking for women whose ovaries are either going to over-respond at high risk of ovarian hyperstimulation, or conversely, women who's, who's, despite their perhaps their younger age, their ovaries are going to produce a more modest response, and then everyone goes in um, prepared for a more difficult outcome. Okay, so let's look at AMH for midlife women. What happens then around the time of menopause? Well, if just to go back a second, so... So AMH actually shows a, a, a biphasic trajectory over the reproductive lifespan. So it, it increases. It's actually detectable in girls right through childhood, which is a really big difference to the other reproductive hormones we can measure. And then it increases um, through adolescence and in fact peaks in the early 20s, perhaps 23, 24, thereabouts. Um, incidentally, of course, coincident with when your bone density is at, is at its greatest. And then it steadily declines down to the menopause. And, and initial studies showed that it became undetectable about five years before the menopause. But actually using more sensitive assays, that's pushed that back. So it's now more detectable, much, much closer to the menopause um, than was previously described. So often we think about, you know, um, with the natural history of menopause, giving it self-diagnosis a year. But often people will want to measure their FSHs and, and LHs to see that typical elevation with the fall in the estradiol, but does AMH also become a predictor? Can it be used to diagnose menopause? So it would seem absolutely evident that because it becomes undetectable around the time of the menopause, that it could become part of the diagnosis. And certainly if you have a, a patient where you're not sure what the diagnosis is, where there's real diagnostic uncertainty, then it can be useful because it will clearly distinguish between menopause or even premature menopause and women with other forms of amenorrhea, most obviously polycystic ovary syndrome, where AMH levels tend to be very high. But in the, in the natural menopause as a diagnostic, um, there have been studies that have looked at this and whether it can predict whether you're imminently menopausal. And actually using the most sensitive assays available, it does show some predictive value, but actually it's more predictive of not being about to go through the menopause because there is this sort of uncertainty of, of AMH becoming undetectable, um, really only very close to the menopause. So what those studies tell us, and this is largely the SWAN study, the big US study that published it a year or two ago, 
shows that if you have detectable AMH, you are not likely to go through the menopause or to reach your final periods um, for um, some time yet. That's so interesting. So what about a woman who has premature ovarian insufficiency? What will the AMH be useful for in that case? So at the moment, it's not part of the classic diagnostic workup of those women. Um, you know, whichever sort of, uh, you know, society you look at, the IMS has published on this as well. Um, so, but I think that's going to change um, because I think it can be useful, and particularly um, to highlight the, 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 the likelihood of POI, premature ovarian insufficiency, in women versus other causes of oligoamenorrhea in, in the, these young patients. Because so often we see a really quite a delayed diagnosis in this age group, don't we? You know, people don't think, oh, she's a teenager, she can't have POI. Well, of course she can. And I think for those women, to getting an AMH level that's very low or undetectable will really help focus um, clinicians' minds on the likelihood of that correct diagnosis. So when you look at women with premature ovarian insufficiency, which would the group that you think this would be particularly useful for? Would it be the young teenager or are there other groups with this diagnosis where we would think that this is a thoughtful thing to be measuring? Well, I think the teenager, where there's some uncertainty in the diagnosis, perhaps, and you want to just be absolutely sure, you, you know, you may have other hormones, um, you know, maybe very obvious, but actually, of course, in the early stages of POI, sometimes it can be quite fluctuant, can't you? You can have a, a, an air, a time of, say, four months of amenorrhea, and then, you know, your hormones are very abnormal and your FSH is high, and then you go back and have the test repeated and your periods have come back and your FSH comes back normal. And then I'm sure we've all seen patients where they've actually been falsely reassured that their ovaries are okay. And in that situation, a really low AMH or an undetectable AMH will help clinch the diagnosis. So it's perhaps in the fluctuant stages um, that, that it might be really most useful as an absolute clear indicator of what's going on. So do you think that this will become a hormone that will be more mainstream, if you will, in terms of using it as a tool? Yeah, I absolutely think so. So at the moment, um, I, I was part of the uh, European Society for Human Reproduction and Embryology, the ESRA guideline group on diagnosis and management of POI, which is now quite a number of years ago. And we're just starting the review process to, to restart that uh, guideline development and update it in collaboration with um, the ASRM and with an Australian group as well to try and make a truly global guideline. And, and absolutely AMH or the value of it is going to be critically assessed in this. And it'll be interesting to see whether we, you know, the data really support its value in this um, because, you know, there haven't been a lot of really good studies of diagnostic accuracy, actually. Um, but I suspect that we will be um, having a very firm um, support of its potential value, even if not absolutely um, hard, hard and fast as yet. Well, then we'll have to come back and have another conversation with you. Absolutely well. Thank you so much for joining us.